Right, we're going to get started here in just a minute. Uh, just a few more people are dumping on, so give it a second or two, and then uh, I'll get things started. All right, I think we'll get started here. Uh, appreciate everybody getting on. Uh, my name is Paul Robbins, and uh, I've been helping uh, Woodway with this series um, for this uh, this month. And uh, we'll go through what we have left to do in this uh, uh, series of uh, educational webinars, and then uh, talk about possibly where we can go from here. So uh, some people I want more advanced. Uh, education as well. So to start off uh, today, we're going to be talking about in-season conditioning and assessments. Um, <clears throat> and so throughout here, if you have questions, um, definitely you can do one of two things. You can definitely send me some questions, uh, email me some questions, I'm sorry, uh, through the uh, Q&A here, or um, just raise your hand. Um, so if you want to ask some questions now, otherwise you can definitely email me the questions uh, later on. I'll, I'll get back to you. So uh, depending on how you want to handle it, uh, this is the third in our series, uh, in-season conditioning, like I said. Uh, today, we have one more that's going to be next uh, Wednesday on the WAP bike. Uh, Thompson's going to uh, run that one for us and uh, good, good information on getting more out of the WAP bike with testing as well as um, so program in conditioning. So uh, <clears throat> just real quick, my background, uh, my degrees in exercise science, uh, many probably are familiar with EXOs now, but I worked for Athletes Performance uh, for uh, over uh, 10 years, uh, designing all the metabolic programming, ESD. So that's why I've been asked to do the energy system uh, program here, mainly focus on some in-season assessment and conditioning. So uh, I did that for athletes' performance uh, exos for, uh, like I said, over 10 years. <clears throat> and I've been a consultant with Woodway since 2000 on designing conditioning programs. So that is my background. My degree in exercise science is metabolics. Um, so anything in that area, um, you can definitely ask me questions on either during this session or uh, afterwards. Uh, what I do now, and I've done for the last 10 years, um, is work in the MBA analyzing the game data. Uh, so we capture every movement of every player, every quarter second uh, in the NBA. Um, now doing it in college basketball a little bit, uh, doing it for my fifth year with the USTA. So we're tracking all the players there. Same thing, energy systems, but now based off of actual in-game data, not off of a treadmill test or anything else. And my background was metabolic testing. I did more VO2 tests than most people have ever seen because my back, my for, for 10 years, I did that for every single athlete that walked into athlete's performance. So the thousands of VO2 tests. Uh, now I don't do any VO2 testing. Uh, I pull the data actually from game data. So we talked a lot more about that in uh, my first session that was a couple weeks ago. If you want more details on that, uh, Woodway has put those links out and we, uh, we have those uh, recordings on that. So we can go back and, and look at that more on the details of load management and how I get those loads based on different technology that's out there. Um, when I deal with uh, my teams, again, the NBA, uh, just starting to get into the NFL, USTA, I also ran the uh, hockey combine for five years, so I have some relationship in the NHL. All of them have the same thing that I talk about, okay? I talk about four areas in season, all right? It's that player load. Again, that was what my talk I, I did a few weeks ago um, was on uh, training loads, uh, different types of technology that's out there from just a simple RPE all, and, and trims all the way to this new optical tracking uh, that we use in game. So I discussed that before. But it's a major part, but that's not the only thing we talk about. 
All right, we really do focus on the other parts of the job, the readiness, the training, and the recovery. I'm going to talk a little bit more in this uh, webinar on those three. Okay, how do we look at assessment? How do we design conditioning programs? You know, and like it, the, the title said, I'm really going to focus on in season. I'm going to talk a little bit about our preseason stuff, but really on in season in this talk. Uh, we can get into more detail on preseason, uh, maybe in a more advanced talk later on. Um, but for now, let's start off with um, the session here. Again, we discussed in the past load management, okay, monitoring the intensities and looking at demand. If you want to go back and look at that, you can. It's all uh, Woodway has all those saved for you. Okay. What I really want to talk about today are are we actually in shape for those demands? All right. During the season, it, does that change? And how do we keep uh, players active? And how do we keep them at a high demand and high uh, conditioning level throughout the season with all the other demands they have on them? Okay? So deconditioning during the season is a question I get all the time. Right? I'm going to use probably a lot of references to basketball in this talk, but when I'm talking, it's, I'm talking all sports. I have. NFL, Major League Baseball, all of them come back to me with the same thing. It's like, guys, are my guys getting out of shape during the season because of the season, all right? And other than right now, because this is obviously a lot different uh, than what we're going through right now, but normally the off seasons are actually pretty short, okay? The off seasons, because of all the demands that the team tap, just again, basketball is an example. A lot of European players now that we have, what's happening with them, they actually have a lot of uh, international play that they have to deal with when they get uh, in their off season. So the off season can be shorter and shorter for a lot of sports, okay? The demands, uh, again, people are talking about NFL, you know, they're not in their sessions right now, but they're doing training, they're doing Zooms uh, in this situation right now, but normally, there's camps already starting, okay? There's OTAs, there's, there's things already starting on. So they're off season, it started very quickly. So, um, so that's one problem that we have. The schedule, the season schedule, especially in a sport like the NHL, the NBA, even in, in tennis, where there's a lot of games, a lot of um, matches um, in a very short period of time. Okay, so the schedule is a problem. And a lot of those, is, there's travel. There's a huge issue with travel out there as well. So that's, there's a lot of reasons for that, as well as the coaches, when they do get you together and you do have a chance to practice in season, what do they want to do? They want to play to get you in condition. But are the, that playing, is that actually hitting the true demands of the sport that we need to do? Are we being able to hit those conditioning levels that we need to? So here's just some examples I have for you coming from the NBA. So we have um, a metric that we call performance pace. And this is just how fast the player is moving, okay? In this case here, we're doing it at the team level. This is how fast the team. This is a team schedule. I, I just pulled out one team. I didn't say what the team is, but this is who they played um, during the, the regular season, okay? And you'll see the pace. So this, this is scale of pace, how fast they are moving. Not just running speed, Accelerations and decelerations, high end accelerations, um, and then it's uh, feet per minute. So it's a combination of all those things to make up a pace. So, again, how fast do they play? Just an example of someone, if you're familiar with the NBA at all, someone like the, the Houston Rockets are a little slower paced team. Why? Because they, they get down very quickly, they, they put up shots very quickly but they're not covering a lot of ground. They, they, they go to the three-point line and they pass out the ball and, and shoot. Uh, so they're not doing a lot of movement underneath. So that their pace is actually a little bit slower than you would think, even though their, their shot clock is very short because they like to shoot very quickly, but the guys aren't moving that much. So that's what this is representing, is how much movement they have. So this one team that we're looking at here, these are all the games. You'll see at the beginning of the season, how the pace, the red line is the league average. So this team was above the league average for the first 20 games or so. We see this. It's very common uh, in the NBA. So this is not just a team. This is the league. The pace of the league is actually very fast at the first 20 games or so. All right. 
new players, new situations. They just came out of camp. They're well rested. They're ready to go. They're anxious to go. You see the pace just goes crazy. And then you see midseason slump, you know, in January. You know, this team dropped down below the average. Okay, you have a couple games that pop up over. Okay, then you have around the all-star break, there's another little drop off. So, so is this a fatigue issue? Is this uh, just the situation? Is this the role that they're playing? Those are the questions that we have. Because if you take a look at this game here, I mean, the, uh, the intensity was extremely low. Pace was very low. So all the way through, you'll see that there's a trend like this during the, the entire league. And then in the playoffs, it actually drops even more because of the load go up even higher. So it's kind of an interesting thing that we're watching. Is like, all right, how do I try to maintain my pace? Do I want to play at these high paces here? All right. If I want to play at these high paces here, I need to train for that. How do I maintain that throughout the season so I can be pushing? Maybe the rest of the league is down here. I'm going to want to push here so I can outplay them. All right? Those are things you, you want to think about in any, way, any sport that you're dealing with. Okay, I don't care if it's basketball or football. Same thing. I want to be peaking at the end of the season. I don't want to be peaking at the beginning of the season. All right, That's when I want to be. And I push at the higher level. So how do we condition someone to make sure that they're staying at that top level at the end of the season? That's our main focus. All right. These uh, blue uh, bars here, these represent eight, one player each game. So this is what we call our mechanical intensity. And mechanical intensity, again, is just accelerations and decelerations. All right. So we're looking how much do they accelerate and decelerate? How intense is that? All right. It'd be, the blue shaded area behind here, that's what we call a standard deviation line. So okay, if you hear blue, the uh, blue bars are inside that blue shaded area, that's a normal game for them. Okay, because you're not going to be perfect, you're not going to be on average every single time. You're going to be slightly above, we use a standard deviation of one, slight, slightly below. Also standard deviation of one above and below. So again, all these games here at the beginning of the season, they're all the blue uh, bars are in that shaded area. Okay. They're doing fine. Maybe a little low on this one, but not a big deal. But now we're getting to the end of the season. This is a few years ago that I pulled this data, and I was looking at an athlete and a team that was trying to push for the playoffs, okay? One of their top players pushing into the playoffs. And what's happening here is that his intensity levels, I marked in red here, are actually starting to drop off. So my question is, is again, is that a fatigue issue? All right. Am I not being able to accelerate and decelerate as well at the end of the season? Here, the last three out of five games were below that sh shaded area of standard deviation. Okay. Is that what we really want? That's a question that I have. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I, it's a question. The intensity starting to drop off. Is that intensity dropping off because of fatigue? That's the big question. I have coaches always telling me that they think their guys are getting out of shape, but are they? Do we know that for a fact? Um, we see different trends. So here's just two different trends that show you that it is happening. Um, and more likely, it could be fatigue here. And is that where I want my fatigue to uh, show up? The last uh, five games of the season? No, I want to make sure that those are the games that I'm at the highest level because I'm, I'm pushing to try to make the playoffs or I'm in the playoffs and I'm trying to win. So uh, I want to make sure we're peaking to the end. So that's why this conditioning is very important. And that's why we want to talk about in-season conditioning, because I want to try to maintain that conditioning all the way through the season. And I want to be able to peak at the right time. We use a system like this. It's called our training report. Okay. It really is determining who needs extra work. All right. This is a little more uh, complex. Um, and I'm going to go over it just because of time. I probably won't be able to get the details that I'd like here. But if you want more information on it, I can, I can give it to you. But let me just try to explain this one to you. All right. So what's our training report is based off of is your starters. Again, I'm going to use basketball in this example. I've got four starters that I'm going to use. Okay. You get the blue lines here are your four starters. Right. That is my baseline. I'm going to base all my reserve guys, the guys in the shaded uh, gray behind them, like these, these two and these two here, are comparing to this one player here. All right. These shaded areas here are comparing to this blue player here. And again, these shaded areas uh, comparing to them. This was probably a center up here, so I just got one center uh, reserve in a starter. 
right? Very simple, all right? So again, what I'm trying to do is compare my starters and my bench guys. I want my bench guys to do and be able to step in for a starter if he goes down. That's my ultimate goal with this, all right? So again, are my guys getting enough work? Uh, and are my bench players, my reserves, are they getting enough work that if somebody went down ahead of them, that they actually can step in? We call this the Della Dova effect. Um, and we, we talk about it because it's a, if anybody follows the NBA years ago, Matt Della Dova, in his first stint with the, with the Cleveland Cavs, he was filling in for Kyrie Irving in the playoffs. Kyrie Irving, the starting guard, went down. Matt Delladova had to step in for him. And after three games, you're playing a very high level because Matt Delladova slays at 100 miles an hour all the time. He wore down, okay? He was completely fatigued after three games because he was playing Kyrie Irving's level, not his own, that he had been all season. So that's why, let's just say in this group here, that might be where we're looking at. These are the guards. So this could be Irving, and then one of these guys here could be Deladova. So that's what we're really trying to do, is trying to make sure that I can, I'm going to give my bench players um, enough work so they can step in. And I needed a system so I can then go back to the coach and say, and explain why this guy needs extra work. Why do I need to do extra conditioning for this guy in season, which is not easy to do, all right? All right, you first have to sell the coach, then you have to sell the player. So I have to give them a system and show them, hey, all right. So in this case here, the average for the guys in blue is right in here, okay? A standard deviation or a half a standard deviation is playoff level. A whole standard deviation is playoff level plus. Below, means that they need to do some extra training in program one or program two and program three, depending on in a game situation, okay, a 14 day period, how many games we have. And then based on those games, how many of those games were at different levels? I can use loads, I can use intensity. Use loads for right now. So again, hopefully we're following here because it's not, I understand that the first time you see it, it's, it's a little confusing, but what we're looking for here is that on my starter, this guy in blue, okay, two of his games were average. One game was at playoff level, and then and two games were just below uh, his average. Not bad. That's that, that that's that's good range. Okay, if I go down to this player here, he's had two at average, but then the other ones were below average. So that's just telling me he hasn't had any playoff level games in the last 10, 14 days. Maybe I need to do an extra conditioning for him. Going down to this blue level, he did. No big, no big deal. We're good. Here, again, he did not. So that's telling me maybe I need to do some extra training for them. And then you look at the reserves. Okay? You get a lot of guys down here, all right, that have of the, of the games that they played in, of the six games, all of them were way down here. So he hasn't come even close to the average of his starter. So... That's just telling me I need extra work for them. What does extra work mean? All right. If you need extra work, what we're doing is we're telling you, if you're in training program one, you might need 10 or 15 minutes of interval program hitting around 90% of your max heart rate. Just using heart rate example, I can use different uh, intensity load numbers that I have out there. But we'll just say that in this case here, we're going to just use, to start off with, we're going to use the 90% um, of max heart rate, okay? I'm just saying in a two week period of time, I wanna get at least one 10 to 15 minute interval program for this guy, all right? Somewhere in that 10, 15 um, uh, day period, I need to do at least one 10 to 15 minute interval program. If I have most of my days in training program two, all right? Then I might have to have two of those in that 10 day period. If I'm way down here where you see a lot of the guys, the fives and sixes here, hey, I might have to, now they're in training program three, I need to get two interval programs and maybe another 30 minute endurance program for them, right? So it's just telling me who needs to do extra work and exactly how much, right? Now they're gonna be doing their court work, they're gonna be doing their, their, their drills, they're gonna work with their position coach. So they get a lot of volume already, 
right? But are they getting the game intensity? That's what I want to do. 10, 15 minutes of interval training that is going to be game intensity. So they are prepared to step in. They're really prepared to step in for the last uh, quarter of a game when, we're, when we really need them, okay? So we use a system, something like this, to tell me where they are compared to their starter, but then also how much work they need to do. Are they in program one, two, three, okay? And I went over that a little uh, quick, but it gives you just a feeling that I want to have you at least understand you need to come up with a system to understand who needs the extra work and also a way to describe it to the coach. Why do they need this extra work? And in my case, many times in the NBA, I have to explain to the player okay, this is why you need this. And then what we will do is make that really specific for them. When I'm talking 10, 15 minutes, I want a really specific program for them, which could be four seconds all out, 20 seconds easy, okay? So if you think about this, this could be four seconds all out, sprinting down the court, 20 seconds of doing some type of a drill, uh, shuffling around at, at the uh, underneath the basket uh, and paint, and then they sprint to the other side because we're going to do this three times. So they're going to go sprint, down, do some kind of a drill uh, in, in the paint, sprint back, do that three times in a row before they take a break. So the interval is four seconds of high intensity, 20 seconds of movement, three times in a row, now a minute break. Why do we do that? It's roughly in basketball, you've got that type of a ratio of how much work you're going to do before there is a some kind of a stop to play. Uh, I'm out, uh, foul, uh, balls out of bounds, something like that. So usually three times up and down the court before something happens. You would design this based on the work to rest of your sport, okay? What is the ratio of your sport? We can actually even take actual game data. So in this case here, we, we found a, a, a period in the game, with four seconds all out, only 10 second break, three seconds, five seconds, three, five, five. So this is an actual, um, series of how many times possessions got changed in that um, in that game okay so we really instead of just my guess here was three times four here we actually had six different times all right that there was high uh, work before the 45 second break so you can truly then take game data that's what i was talking about what i've done now is using this tracking data uh, to actually design conditioning programs based off of game data okay and this is an actual game series right in basketball tons of those for football and tennis as well but hopefully that this the, the main thing i want to get out of this is that you're trying to come up with a program to look at what is my reserves how much do my reserves have to do compare them so they are ready to jump in for my starters if my starters are not also getting in here like these guys here maybe they have to do a training program one once uh every 14 days because every once in 14 days i want to make sure that they're at playoff level right oh so again gives me a feel it's like and it's i want to keep stressing 10 15 minutes that's it i'm not looking for a 45 minute conditioning i'm not looking for a crazy thing up and down sprints up and down the court i'm looking at something specific and really designed towards their work demands of the sport easier for the, for the players to, to buy into that okay now, this fits into our whole five phases of ESD. I'm going to go through this just kind of quickly today, uh, but maybe we can have a more advanced talk on this uh, later on. But it works in with the whole five phases that we deal with uh, for preseason, then in season, because I can use some of this in season as well. All right. Hopefully our work capacity is there. All right. Our first phase is work capacity. You know, working around 65, then soon a little bit of 85, uh, touching up there for a few minutes, back down to 65, really building base, uh, our base for them. And again, hopefully, since we're talking about in season here, we should be there with everybody. But you can always go back to it in season as well, just to throw a week in there if you need to, just to build off it. Uh, more common is what we would call our improve uh, anaerobic threshold, uh, our AT, and that's the normal one-to-one, -one, two-to-two, two-to-one type of, uh, of work, all right? So I would start this when I'm doing in this phase. I usually use this um, on equipment. So I use a treadmill, 
I'll, I'll use a bike and I'm looking for work for one minute on, one minute off, right? Work my way up to eventually two to two or uh, my higher level will be two to only one minute recovery, right? So I would be improving uh, ET. Again, in season, hopefully we already have that. We shouldn't need that so much in season. But if we have to do a return to play athlete, I would actually bring them back through this as well. That's our, our second phase. Then these are the, the phases that I might be using in season a little bit to try to keep into that last 10 minutes, that 15 minute intervals that we were just talking about. Okay. But I might start off with just a simple uh, example of a jog to sprint for one to one. Again, I've already built myself up moving the uh, improvement. ATs that I, think I can handle one to ones. All right. Now, my one to ones might be not just straight one minute runs. Okay. I'm going to break it up to be a little bit more sport specific, where I'm going to jog for 30 yards, sprint for 10, turn around, jog for 30, sprint for 10 again. I'm going to do that for a minute straight. Right. That is now taking this improved AT one to one, which is steady one minute run. Now, I'm going to put some accelerations and decelerations in that. So, um, and eventually I would turn that into a sprint to jog. So I might change around. It's going to be a sprint for the 30 yards and just jog for 10, turn around, sprint for 30. So, um, and that could be from a dead stop. Um, so that's our linear power uh, phase. And then we would do the same thing with our multi-directional. Now, when I'm, I'm doing my one-to-one, -one, I'm going to explode for, um, from, from this cone to this cone here is going to be around eight yards because we got 10 here five here so that's going to be about eight yards total here so i'm going to explode out here shuffle across explode again what i'm really looking now is i'm still taking that one-to-one -one, uh work instead of just doing linear runs i'm now going to add an acceleration and a deceleration another acceleration and another deceleration into it keep rotating back i would jog from here back to the beginning start over and do it again do that for one minute again if i work my way up to twos or the two to one maybe i can throw those in as well but again the more um these are very simple this is my very simple six cone drill the whole goal of it is to change your direction it's not supposed to be complicated it's supposed to be one minute of hard work so i'm really focusing on the acceleration and deceleration in this I, there's a lot of variations off of this that I have that we can slowly bring in some sports specific type of stuff. But at first, the whole goal is I'm really working on the energy systems here. I'm really trying to work on acceleration, decelerations as well. All right. So that's what I really want to get. So again, in season, I can work all the way through these. The sports specific is basically the example that I just gave a second ago with the basketball, four seconds on, 20 seconds off. Um, in, at this point, you want your drills to be um, based on the demands of your sport. What is your work to rest in sport? We have a great hockey one, which is a 45 second chip. We have different ones for football based on alignment and, and um, uh, running backs versus quarterbacks and cornerbacks. Okay, so that's sport specific. What is the actual work to rest? In a football, what does a two minute drill look like truly for alignment versus a defensive back? So that's how you would work your way through the five phases, even in season to make sure that we're maintaining that conditioning, right? Now we're taking it another level, okay? So no matter what we're doing, that we're continuing to do the research. How can we take it to the next level? All right. So this year, I just want to show some stuff that we're doing with Woodway. The, it's altitude training. I've done altitude training. Probably many of you have done some type of altitude training in the past. The whole concept of the red, increased red blood cells to try to maintain and be able to, if I had to go, uh, when I was working in soccer, we would do it to prepare the U.S. team to go play like Mexico City. Um, in Mexico City, where obviously it's higher altitude and air quality was poor. So what we're trying to do is how do we improve um, our cardiovascular for high altitude? That's one way of doing that steady state altitude training, right? Now what we've looked at and we found the research on is actually interval training. Going back to what I was just talking about, our actual interval training, doing that at altitude, right? And giving us more of a cardiovascular improvement going down to the cellular level okay increasing 
at the cellular level, cardiovascular wise. And again, this is where we can bring back my 10 to 15 minutes of intervals at altitude, right? Same concept I had before, but I can take it to the next level. Two quick studies I want to show you. This is a soccer one, all right? So many are very familiar with the yo-yo test. They did the yo-yo test. Then they did the short interval uh, program afterwards for conditioning for eight weeks. Uh, <clears throat> and the group that did it at sea level, just because, again, even if I was just doing my five phases of BSD, especially phases uh, three, four, and five, my intervals, they are effective, okay? So the group that was just doing it just those intervals at sea level increased 14% over that eight week program in their yo yo test. But the ones that did it in altitude increased 32%. Exact same workouts, exact same timing, everything was the same for them. One just did it in altitude chamber, the other ones did it um, and at just normal sea level. You'll see a 32% increase opposed to just 14. So that shows me that I can get more at a higher level using this type of altitude training. Down here, another study, again, same thing, uh, pre and post intervals, type of same type of interval program, short intervals. Uh, at sea level, you see that at post, they actually did improve. Okay, so the five phases, they work. It's not that they don't work. Can I take it to another level? That what we did at altitude, oops, sorry, click too fast. At altitude here, we were actually we can do more we can sustain it longer we actually be able to do more sprints by doing the altitude type of training right so not only did i improve but i was able to do it longer so again that's where the research is coming in we just finished some case studies at uh, tulane just before everything uh we had shut down so i got some good data on that uh, a very good start there but that's the next level Okay, that's where interval training, and you do this in season. Again, I don't have to load somebody up. I'm, my whole concern is I don't want to have high loads for everyone because I don't want to blow them up because they still have to practice. I still got to train. Um, so if I can just add this to it, short 10, 15 minutes, once, twice, um, in a 14-day in period of time, that's it. That's what I need, but I need to do that to maintain so I don't have those dips that I showed you earlier in my intensities at the end of the season, right? This is what we're trying to do. How do we do this um, and make it very effective? Now, how do I know that I can handle these loads, right? In-season assessment. So yes, I can create all this great cardio. I have my five phases. I have these interval trainings in altitude. Are they actually handling this? Are they improving, all right? Those are the things that you still need to do. So I really stress, in-season assessments and the in-season assessments have to be simple okay i love this 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 was not even a, a research study this was actually some data that we collected during the nhl combine a few years ago right so follow me on this one because my biggest concern i have out there are our assessments actually telling us anything we're and, and people are like well i don't do assessments during the year because well, what am i going to do with the data well First of all, you gotta have an assessment that makes sense. And I wanna show you this one. So everyone's familiar with the 5105. Just a simple shuttle, five yards, back 10, back five to finish up with. Everyone uses it, you see it in the NFL all the time. Well, the NHL used it for the combine as well. First of all, in the NHL combine, this is done on a basketball court surface. It's not done on ice, right? There's lots of reasons for it because of the, the timing of everything. But just to remember, first of all, they're 17, 18 year old kids from all over the world, all right? And they're doing this on a basketball court. So, so my first thought is, well, how good are these kids at 510.5? How many things have they uh, trialed the 510.5? Uh, most of them just learned that maybe a month beforehand and done it maybe a, a half a dozen, a dozen times at the most just to practice. So they're not great at the 510.5. I'm with me because that's not what I was looking for. What am I looking for is we put an accelerometer on them and I wanted to see who actually could accelerate the best, right? Not just who had the best times. Again, 5105, here's some guys that did 4.2. 4 so these guys were really fast, okay? They were the fastest guys, all right? Meaning that they were very good at the 5105. 
didn't mean that they were the best hockey players, and they certainly didn't mean they were the best uh, for accelerations. The guys with the highest accelerations were up here, okay? These are the guys that I'm looking at, all right? Not all these guys down here. The average speeds were like four, four six, and four seven. Those were the most of the guys were at, okay? But what I was looking for is I'm looking for these guys up here that had the highest acceleration because somebody could have a four six in a high acceleration. Let's say this guy in the red here, or even better here, this guy way up here in the red. These two players up here, but at times of four five, which were good times, but didn't really stick up, but their accelerations were really good, right? So that just means that they probably, because they were not good at the 5 10 5, they probably ran six yards, came back, ran 12 yards, came back, and finished up at, at the 5. So that just means they were not great at the 5 10 5. They couldn't go short. You can't go four yards and turn, right? You would have to stop and redo the test. But if you went past it, nobody made you do the test again. You just weren't efficient at it. So but what they were, the guys up here with the highest accelerometer, okay, they could accelerate the best. That's what I'm really trying to get out of this. Those are the guys that I really want, okay, who can accelerate really well, all right? So that's the guys at the top here. With the guys in the red are actually the guys who are the, the top guys who were drafted. So that somebody must have realized that, okay, this guy, right, not only is these, th these three guys, especially these three guys in the red, they weren't your best times. Again, four, five, four, six, four, seven, but they were great athletes because they had very high acceleration and they, they probably showed up in a lot of other things as well as being three or better athletes. So that's what I want to make sure is when you're looking at and designing uh, conditioning programs uh, or assessments, uh, what are you actually getting out of it? So oh, I thought that was an interesting one. So one thing that we're talking a lot about right now, the NBA is a return to play, hopefully, possibly. Uh, return to play in this, uh, this, um, because of the shutdown. And if we do that, what are we going to do? All right. If you've got guys coming back, what, what kind of assessments are we going to do? And what are we going to, what are we going to try to get out of the assessment? We're thinking some simple assessments like a shuttle run. All right. Or 300s. People are more familiar with the 300s. All right. A shuttle one that we could do is just foul line, three point line, half court, and back. something that simple where I'm going to get some longer acceleration, shorter acceleration, and I'm also going to get that deceleration in there as well. All right. What I'm really looking for in this is that I am going to look at my uh, times over those, if I do it two or three times, I'm going to first of all look at time, give them a one minute break. Okay, so I'm going to record the time. But I'm also going to make sure that I'm videotaping this because I'm going to be looking at the technique. How are they decelerating? How are they acceler accelerating? Again? If I'm going to do this, again, because of this, this unique stoppage and, and return to play, what do they look like? Their movement patterns look like on the court is going to be very important. So if I can do that and videotape it and do this once a week and not a hard workout not something's going to blow them up something i can i can throw in once a week as a conditioning but also a little bit of a test i'm going to also videotape it so i can look at the technique right? if i was going to use something like the connects on um accelerometers that we were using in that hockey i'm also going to look at the accelerometers and the, the accelerations and the speed that compared to what they've done in the past right so if you have an accelerometer based thing Connect on is the one that we use in the NBA and in, in, in other leagues, but I'm really trying to focus on trying to get more out of it. So I, I turn the, the accelerometer on. I, I turn on the tracking data so I can actually get some of that acceleration and speed data. Uh, it's very important. So it's not just straight time. And then, of course, I'm going to try to use heart rate uh, recovery as well. I'm looking for that one minute break. How's the heart rate breaking back down? I want to repeat this. You know, every week, every two weeks at the most, I want to see how are they handling this during the season. Okay, if I want to, just to give you another example of it, maybe that would this linear stuff that I was just talking about here. That's great for uh, for your bigs, but maybe in a guard, I might do that six cone that I was just talking about earlier. So I'd have them spread down to the six cone in the paint, come back down the other end to the six cone in the other paint and do that a few times so you can start adding to it this is what you're really looking for when you're doing your assessment is i want to make sure i can get something out of it that i can use and determine 
are these guys handling it and what are my next steps? That's what the assessment's for. You don't have to go to some uh, research manual and say, okay, that assessment is what we're gonna use. Like, uh, why would somebody use the Bruce protocol uh, for a VO2 test on an athlete when it's just straight incline, it's a high incline, and I'm gonna blow up their calves before I get anything out of them. So I have to understand what am I trying to get out of the assessment? Design the assessment that works for you. That's what I really wanna get across to you. You don't have to go and use something out of a manual. There's a ton of ways to look at assessments, okay? Another way that we're talking about the assessments is using some of the Woodway products here, all right? So basically what we have here, we have two different ones. Uh, we have the curve, right? Just before all this happened, we were doing a research study on the, the curve with uh, this protocol here. What I'm looking for out of the, the, the study is much more than just a final number. What I'm looking for is to try to see where there's a breakdown for that athlete. Again, that's why I was doing in the shuttle runs, I wanna look at the videotape, I wanna look at heart rate, I wanna look at the accelerometer data, I wanna look at the tracking data, I wanna see how much that is gonna tell me a lot more about that athlete. On something like the curve, all right, we came up with a two minute steady run, all right? Cover as much distance as you possibly can. If you've never used the curve, it's a non-motorized treadmill, so two and a half minutes is a good workout, all right? So we're going to try to cover as much that um, uh, distance again. I'm, again, I'm not using. I'm using this in season, so I don't want to blow somebody up. All right. So I'm just trying to get two and a half minutes should be a good good run. I can't do a VO2 test on them now. Uh, again, that's my background, but I'm not going to do a 12, 15 minute VO2 test on you every week. Uh, that just doesn't make sense. But if I can do three minutes, which is two and a half minutes steady, plus a 30 second what we call 30 second run. Really what's happening in that 30 second run, I want to give me one attempt, so as fast as you can in that 30 seconds. So really we're doing one explosive, five to eight second explosive sprint inside that. Finish that 30 seconds. So that's gonna bring me into that total of three minutes. So what's happening here is now I've got, I've got my distance that I covered in body weight, will give me a power. I'm just doing distance times body weight. Very simple, all right? Give me a score from uh, power, all right? I'm gonna look at my max speed that I had in that 30 second run, all right? 13, so my max speed, I can convert that into mats. Give me an estimated VO2, okay? And then I'm gonna look at heart rate recovery. Just like I did in the shuttles, I wanna look at a one minute heart rate recovery. If I add up those three red numbers, I can get an actual score. Right? This is where the validation and stuff that we're coming up with at ASU and trying to tweak this, pro this protocol a little bit. But what I want you to think about, though, is how can you do this with whatever type of equipment that you have? How can you do this? I'm looking for something that's going to tell me much more than just one number. I have it here because people like this one number at the end, but I want, to, I want more out of it. Okay, so if I retest you a week later and I can't hit the top speeds here, all right, so that's going to tell me something. Maybe I did a cover distance a little bit more, but I didn't hit the top speed. So I could have got a 371 again, but maybe my heart rate didn't recover. So I'm looking at these three numbers opposed to just one. Even if this number is the same, are these the same? Okay, or if this number increased, which one increased? Is my heart rate dropping faster? That's great. I'm recovering better. Okay, that's a good fitness level. All right, can I explode better and get a better speed at 13? Can I get a better speed number here? All right, or did I cover more distance? What is improving or what is not improving? Opposed to one number at the end, which if, if I'm just doing assessments and I'm just doing time, that's one number. Okay, I've covered the same distance and my time is now the same. Well, is the assessment really the same? Did I accelerate the same? Did I, um, is my heart rate coming down the same? Oh, there's much more to get out of it than just straight time. So an assessment like this, I'm looking at three different things. That's what you need to think about. How do I design something that's going to give me more answers, but in still in three minutes? That's the key. The key. I'm doing it in three minutes. That's what I'm really trying to get. And another three minute test. The WAP bike. Love the WAP bike. Why do I like the WAP bike so much? Because it's true wattage. That's the biggest problem I have out there if I'm doing it on anything else. If I don't have the actual wattage and repeatable wattage, 
then I'm concerned because I don't know if I'm truly improving or not. So that's why I like to get the watch. I want to see the watch. Um, they have a, the Watt bike has a great three minute. This is a very hard test. Um, three minutes, try to stay as high uh, wattage as you can. So if I average at the end of three minutes, 340 watts, okay, and I weigh 200 pounds, my VO2 estimate was a 47. That's simple. That gives you a very simple VO2 estimate after three minutes. I'm trying to maintain it. Again, if I know that my average watts right now is 340, next week I'm going to try to hit 341. The next week I'm going to try to hit 342. That's what you're trying to do. Something to shoot for. Looking at heart rate, heart rate recovery at those as well. Very simple. You can also do some very short repeats, uh, six seconds or that four to 20 that I talked about before. So if you don't want to do a full three minutes, you think that's going to be too much, or someone, then just do some power repeats, okay? Short little bursts, power repeats for them. Look at repower and power recovery. Those are some different examples of assessment that you should be doing every week, every two weeks, depending on the situation. Like I said, return to play in the NBA right now. Uh, if we do, I want to probably do it every week. But if you're in a normal season, every two weeks is probably plenty. Okay? Now, also with that, assessments, uh, I was hoping to have Mark from Woodway jump on, but uh, the good news is he's actually installing some of this technology in a hospital right now, so that's uh, I'm going to have to fill in for him there in this talk, this piece of the talk, but uh, um, we have the Technobody, which is going to look at other movement assessments. So talking about cardiovascular assessments up there, now we need to look at movement assessments. We need to look at balance, jump, gait, functional movements, range of motion, proprioception. That's what I need to also look at. How are my loads, how is the season affecting? How is the ramping up that I have, the protocols that I've created for this athlete for conditioning or even the weight room, are they actually, how is that affecting them? Okay, so some simple assessments that they have uh, in, in the, 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 the techno body, okay? I can look, you know, uh, on this basically, a, a force plate type of uh, technology. So we're going to be able to look at uh, different ranges of motions, okay? We can assess any of the weight shifting. We can do some jump assessments and a, a functional movement assessment, but not a, the typical functional movement assessment where you're going to give them a score of one to three, okay? And that's your subjective uh, scoring. This is going to be uh, objective, going to be using the fourth flight that he's on, we're going to be looking at the actual movement and the, the assessment throughout. So it's a great baseline. And uh, looking at throughout the season, is the fatigue catching up to them? Is there like an asymmetry issue? What, what could be the issue? So movement assessments are also very important. And same thing with the gait analysis, okay? They also, as you do, see on a woodway treadmill, they can do very simple gait analysis, gait analysis runs. So again, I'm looking at that movement assessment, not just a, a cardiovascular assessment, right? And get much more detail in it, especially that asymmetry uh, that we're looking for. Okay? So some type of movement, type of assessment, uh, range of motion assessment, it's extremely important. Another one that we've been playing around with is a company called Play. Ego. And basically, this is a uh, the, the question I had way back. It's like, all right, if I'm in my hotel room and I come down to breakfast, how do I assess that simple walk? All right, down to breakfast. So that was the question that we had years ago. Found a company that very thin inserts. That's why Tig is a very thin insert, accelerometer, so you can slide it into the shoes. And I'm going to actually get ground contact information off of this. So in asymmetry data, so they've come up with three very simple assessments, a simple walk. Okay, so maybe I'm not gonna get the walk down to breakfast, but I am gonna have you walk uh, for 30 meters and walk back. And I'm gonna have you run, not a sprint, just a run. I'm looking at that um, ground contact and, and your data analysis and that run back. And then very simple, a uh, typical jump, 20 little jumps. So, Things like that, just to keep very simple type of movement assessments so I can see where am I at with that athlete at that time frame. Okay, so those are actually very important things to be looking at is 
All right. Am I handling the loads? That's what we really want to get across. Am I handling the loads? So with this, it's readiness. All right. So um, I am a big advocate. I, I do not work for Oral Ring, uh, but I will have to say that uh, it's one of those products that I have tested them all. That's that's the the main thing. It's like when it comes to technology, I have a lot of it sent to me because obviously these companies want to work with um, with teams in the leagues that I work with. So they'll send it to me. I'll test it out if I like it, and I might send it then to a team and, and get their feedback to see if it makes any sense or not. All right. <clears throat> One thing I've tried all the wrist based ones. Okay, the whoops, the uh, the bases. Um, all these other risk-based uh, data that you're collecting. There's the problem with those is just the connection at the, the wrist is poor. So the heart rate there is at rest is fine, uh, but during activity and stuff, it's not great. Um, and the technology, we're not. It. All I can say is, in the MBA validation, the whoop did not pass uh, the MBA validation. Okay, it's an independent validation of a uh, university in Europe that did it. So, but the one that we've been doing, and I do a lot of stuff also with the military, the one that has stood out is this aura ring. It's a simple ring on your finger. Again, I don't sell anything. I, I have no association with these guys, except that I have been personally using this since September. And I really wanted to show this because my job has me traveling a lot. <clears throat> I will travel at least three times a month, not always uh, very long, maybe two nights, three nights uh, at a time. So it's not like I'm gone for three weeks, but I'm in and out of airports all the time, different time zones all the time. Very interesting. Uh, and now that I haven't done it, so I wanted to show you this. This is heart rate variability. So what this order ring is going to give me, this is my other readiness assessment. I want to look at the heart rate variability. People talk about it all the time, heart rate variability, but you got to have good reliable data. Um, I feel this has been very good data, which is interesting here. These are the last few weeks. So you can see um, for the beginning of this year, we're 21 weeks into the, the year. Okay, this here, this time frame right here is basically when everything shut down, all right? So I had not, uh, so obviously there's a lot of stress, everybody, was, everybody I was just trying to figure out what was happening during the shutdown, everything going on, all right? So my average heart rate variability, and again, I had an expert come on with my webinars, Mark Stevenson, and talk about heart rate variability. Everybody, heart rate variability for everybody is different. Once you have your baseline, then you go off of that. My baseline was a 32. Uh, <clears throat> so in, in that, my sleep, this is my sleep heart rate variability. My baseline was the 32. It would be good weeks and bad weeks, mainly because of travel. Um, but as you can see here, these are the last few weeks, all right, that I've now been home for like nine weeks, right? The initial being home was not great uh, for, you know, everybody was trying to get used to it and figure it out. But now my body has actually adjusted, gotten comfortable. Look at my heart rate variability. This is just me personally. My heart rate variability is actually increasing and, and in my resting heart rate has actually been dropping. Uh, I should have shown you even better. This whole week has been in the 40s. My average is probably around a 50 before. Now my average is close to a 48. So it, what I'm just saying is travel makes a big difference. All right, as you all know, but this was just a good way that for me to show it as well, just a personal experience. So with that, we're looking at other technologies. Like I said, I'm, I, we're using the, the uh, altitude training for our, our assessments, and we're looking at case studies there. We're, we're trying to come up with assessments and working with ASU on a more and better curve assessments. This is another one here, over here. This is called a Apollo, all right? Uh, another uh, device that we've been playing around with. And I'm not an expert in these, but I just wanted to bring these up because these are all come down to making sure that I'm ready. If I'm going to push you hard, I want to make sure that you can recover and move to the next level. The Apollo, this actually goes on my ankle. You can put it on your wrist or your ankle, I put it on my ankle. And there's different um, settings here that's just a very, very th uh, fine uh, vibration. Don't even feel it. 
And basically, there's different settings. Like, I'll use this meditation in mind. So what it's trying to do is put you in that meditation state or a relaxing state. This is a relaxing state here. The one that's not uh, shown here is asleep. It's supposed to calm you down. For two. And I've been using this since the first of the year. And again, that's been helping my heart rate variability going up as well. So it's a very simple, my whole goal for in the NBA, if you think about their, um, their days, uh, usually baseball, same issue, playing late, and then either have to jump on a plane and go to the next city, um, or get ready for the next game or next practice. It's a, it's a quick turnaround. Um, so what can I do to bring them back down without alcohol, without any other types of um, medications, all right? I'm trying to find ways to get them to relax. And it's Apollo, again, very early for me, uh, but has some really good research out there. Um, and my uh, expert, Mark Stevenson, he uh, also agreed that this is the, the direction a lot of it's going. So um, something to just take a look at. Um, it's called Apollo. I think, I think if you look it up, Apollo Neuro, apolloneuro.com. Um, if anybody wants more information, get a hold of me. But again, we're look, we're constantly looking for new technology like this all the time. So, um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about is recovery treatments. Again, extremely important. There's a lot of different ones out there, but what we're really doing is putting together our recovery treatments along with our loads so based on how much the loads the intensities of that day the, the volume of work that day which of these uh treatments are you going to use and how long would you use each one so that's the next step with this so it's not just the same recovery treatment after every single workout after every single training um, or or game they are based on the loads and the intensities so uh, a lot of research coming out of the Rockford Center uh, in West Virginia. Um, so that's where we're really focusing on right now. A new uh, technology that we've been playing around with um, just before all this happened, and now I know a couple of teams that are, are back into it, is these very small nano bubbles. Uh, this, this, Bimini, this is another one that we're, we're just starting supposed to start a research study we have to figure out where our timing of that is but it's it's actually sitting it's it's in one of these tubs but it's the best picture i have but it's not an ice tub it's actually um body temperature so you're sitting in there and basically the concept is is that these very very fine bubbles that you can't even see actually can penetrate in and, and get into the muscle and the cellular uh level um much quicker than just at the surface that you would see uh, most of the treatments that are doing. So this Bimini is brand new, uh, a lot of great case, case studies. Again, I personally have done this three times and uh, all three times my walk bike three minute test that I showed you guys earlier, I improved every single time. So, um, so there's something there, need more research on. But that's again, the direction that we're going. So, uh, three quick takeaways here. There are five phases of ESD, and you need each one to make sure that you're not overtraining. You need to monitor the athlete to understand who needs additional work. An assessment in season that fits your needs and gives you the most um, that you can act on. I really want to make sure that you can act on it. That's, if I'm going to do an assessment, if I'm going to do uh, a condition, can I actually act on it? That's extremely important. So. Um, this is, uh, if you want more information, there's the uh, uh, woodway.com, uh, info at woodway.com. This is my information that I have here. Uh, my um, sports performance job with uh, Kinexon overseeing the in-game data for a, a number of sports. Like I said, I have a data scientist, uh, Greg, uh, who worked very closely with me and has helped me out with this uh, presentation as well. So I always want to thank him. Um, so if you have any questions on this, I have one question that did come in that I do want to answer really quickly, and then try all I have time for it because we're at the top of the hour. If somebody else has something, the one question I had with what somebody had asked me um, about is the the when I was talking about the 10-15 minute intervals, when do I do that? And that's a great question. The great the question is when do I do those 10-15 minute intervals? 
in a practice, I do it at the end of practice. And the reason I do it at the end of practice is because I want you to already have the, the, the work done, the volume. So you're already fatigued coming into that 10, 15 minutes. But that 10, 15 minute phase, I am now going to overload you. I'm taking you to another level. Again, only gonna do this once or twice at the most in a two week period of time. So I'm not going crazy, but I want to, I want to make sure that we're in a fatigue state. You're in the fourth quarter. Okay, you're at the end of the soccer game already. You're, you're in the third period of hockey, the last 10 minutes. That's the state that you should be in. All right, cool. Now I'm going to put you hard for the last 10 minutes. I'm going to truly overload you at that point. Um, when I was at Athletes Performance, I get that all the time. Guys would go through their, their prehab. They'd go through their, their speed training. They would go through their strength training. Then they'd eventually show up with me to do their conditioning. And they would say, hey, my legs are really tired from all the work that I've already done. Say, Perfect, that's great, let's go. Because now I'm gonna take you, because you're already in the fourth, your legs are tired, you're in the fourth quarter. Let me take you to the next level. So that's where I like to put that in. So that was a great question. Uh, if you have other questions, there's my email. You can send them off to me, anything else that you have. But I appreciate you guys uh, listening on this webinar. Uh, went over just a little bit, but uh, also, um, just to finish up, there's next week, uh, Thompson's going to be doing more details on the, uh, the walk -by. So I appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk to you guys uh, next week. Thank you.